Hello, it's time to learn about marine facies and unconformities. Through this point in the semester, you've had a foundation in the basics of geology, such as geologic principles, learning about the different parts of the earth and how they work, how we know what their structure is, their composition. You learned about plate tectonics, minerals, igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, fossils, the rock cycle, I think you get the gist. You have the foundational pieces that you need to start interpreting the physical world around you. That's where this section comes in. So let's take a look at what you've got right in front of you with Lover's Leap located in Waco, Texas, right along the Brazos. And this is a section that connects to Cameron Park. It's all one big continuous section. There's even a trail you can hike or run along this section of Lover's Leap, all the way to McLennan Community College from Cameron Park. This is no more than four or five minutes from the downtown silo district in Waco. That's not what's important here. What's important are the rock layers. While Lover's Leap has a historical frame and a story that goes with it, the geologic story is significant. Here's why. Waco, Texas, and basically most of Texas, was covered by an apiric sea, which is a shallow sea, for a majority of the Mesozoic off and on, certainly during the Cretaceous period, which was the end of dinosaur reign. So these fossils that you would find in the rocks here are going to be marine, not terrestrial. So that's important because we use the clues that you have learned about all semester to start deciphering the geology mystery that's locked in these rocks. Now you might know that it looks like it has layers, right? And there are distinctive rock strata layers. In between each one of those blocky layers is a very thin layer of a shale type unit. That is indicative of a lowering of sea level, while the big white stuff that you see, the big white rock uh, bulky layers, those are indicative of sea level rises called transgressions. So there's a universal geology language to help break the barriers of linguistics, meaning language from one part of the world to the next that may not be understood by people. But if you're trained as a geologist, you will know this language no matter what. So I'll tell you a story. I was coming home from a trip to Hawaii on the airplane, and it was an overnight flight. Unfortunately, I got in the middle seat, and there was someone conked out on the right side against the window aisle seat. You know, I'm just not paying attention to him. And the guy next to me was Chinese. He was busy doing something, and of course, he didn't really speak English. I certainly didn't speak Chinese. But I'm looking through my geology pictures from Hawaii, then from the geology field course that summer, just a few months before that. And I mean, it's in the middle of the night, and he's like, whoa! He's so excited. He's, and I'm like, okay, what did I just do to you? <laughs> And he's pointing at the picture. So I understood that he was excited about them. So he reaches in the pocket of the seat in front of him, pulls out one of those bags that you use if you get sick, and start, takes out a pen and pencil and starts to sketch and draw rock layers. Well, I was specifically looking at Zion National Park. So he was able to draw sandstone that was cross-bedded. Right then and there, it was very clear that this was a trained geologist. While we didn't speak the same regular language that we spoke as I'm talking to you now, we could easily communicate with geologic symbols. So they're used on maps and diagrams like this one block diagram. And they're significant because there's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of different rock symbols. For this class, we're gonna keep it fairly simple and I'll tell you that things like basalt and granite, there are a number of different types of symbols that you can use for every different type of rock, but some of them are pretty standard. So we're going to use the basic standard symbols that I think you need to understand for marine facies and unconformities. 
So sedimentary rocks are depicted in a very specific way. And I'm going to go through all of these individually, but I want to kind of frame it this way. The geologists who came up with these symbols were using common sense. And you'll notice that it's fairly simple. So when you see these rock layers in nature, they actually look like how we draw them, which is exactly why we draw them that way. And I'll take something like breccia over here on the left. It has very angular class to various different sizes. Well, that's exactly what you would see in that type of rock. So as we go through these, I want you to be thinking about, okay, well, that makes sense. Because when you start to see rocks like sandstones, siltstones, shales, limestones, conglomerates, breccias, even dolostone, you'll start to recognize that they have a similar characteristic to the symbol in which is used to depict them. So let's start with two easy ones, breccia and conglomerate. Notice that breccia has about 50% or more angular clast and that you get very angular, bigger clasts with smaller ones embedded in with it. Now you see a picture of breccia beneath that. You can see how they work together, right? Okay, on the right side here, we have a conglomerate, and conglomerates basically have predominantly rounded class, like 50% or more rounded class of, of various sizes. And you look at the drawing of how we depict that, you can see that that looks like the rock. Let's look at some of the real important ones for using in marine facies, which is sandstone, siltstone, shales. And then we'll get to limestone in a minute. Sandstone is done with dots of similar size. They're not circles, they're dots. If they were circles, the class would be too large. So you've already learned about the sedimentary class range size chart that we had back in that section. So we need to have grains that would depict the size of the sediments in sandstone. That's why you see just dots and not circles. Now, let's move into siltstone. And notice that silt, and you've touched this hopefully in class by now, <laughs> you know that sand has a real sandpaperish feeling, depending on how coarse the grains are. When you get to siltstone, it's gritty, but it's not really as rough or coarse as you would see with sandstone, certainly not as smooth to the touch as something like shale. So it has a little bit of sand grains, but not very many. So that's why we're using dash dot, dash dot because the dots represent the sand, the dashes represent the clay or the shale that's in that rock. Which brings me to shale or mudstone. We draw this particular rock with all dashes. And I want to point out, as you look at this picture right here, notice the thin laminate layers of that particular rock. And that's why we use paper thin layers to draw it because exactly what it looks like in nature. Another really important rock when we're talking about marine facies are the carbonate rocks such as limestones and dolostones. Limestone in particular is one of the key rocks that are used in diagrams for understanding if ancient marine conditions existed. So when you see limestone, I just showed you a minute ago, Lover's Leap, how blocky those big rock uh, layers were of white on the cliff. That's this rock right here. Matter of fact, that came from the same geologic formation that makes up Lover's Leap, which is the Austin chalk. That's a chalk limestone that exists there. So we draw limestone with all blocks or bricks. If you get dolostone, which is just slightly different from limestone because it has some magnesium in it, then you take those blocks and you tilt them to the side. That differentiates whether you have limestone or dolostone in an area. They weather differently, so the differential weathering capacity could be important for a geologist if you knew you had slanted bricks on your rock map, meaning your geology map or your block diagram, because it is a little tougher than limestone. That brings us into igneous rocks, and I must be blunt, there are dozens and dozens of various different types of igneous rock symbols. We're just going to make it simple in this particular lesson. Use a phaneritic texture, which is shown on the left with, with basically lines for the various different minerals that are 
interconnected for something like granite. And that is a fairly standard thing. Now, I'm only going to make you learn one for intrusive or plutonic rocks, and I'm only going to have you learn another symbol for volcanic. But I need to be clear, we can, as geologists, determine exactly what rock layers in an area once it's been mapped because the symbols are very specific. So literally, there's a symbol for the different types of basalt, the different types of rhyolite, the different types of uh, intrusive rocks. So it's important you understand that these are just generic. So when you get a volcanic rock, which is an extrusive igneous rock, like a lava or some kind of pyroclastic material, like this is pumice, you would use all V's for volcanic. <laughs> so there's another way to do it, like I said, for very specific rocks, but we'll make it simple. We still have metamorphic rocks to contend with. And again, there are dozens of different types of metamorphic symbols when you're talking about gneiss and schist and phyllite and slate, and then you're looking at quartzite and marbles and greenstones, various different things, and coal. So let's talk about just generally how we're going to do most metamorphic rocks. We'll do it with the little lightning bolts or jagged lines, which is an indicator of compression and heat. So you would use that for any metamorphic rock in this class except for coal. So let me talk about coal. If you recall, if you look at the bottom picture for coal, that's shale. You just saw shale a minute ago, and we did shale with all dashes, right? That's a sedimentary rock. Shale that contains biological material, such as plant matter, very organically enriched. As it undergoes burial with new rock layers on top of it, it can then start to metamorphose into different grades of coal. So we take those layers for shale and then we add the compression to it and that's why you see the vertical lines that go through part of those shale lines. So that's, if you saw that on a map, that's why it's important because you go, okay, yeah, that's a coal seam. That's important for the area. It's just a clue. All of these are clues to help us decipher the mysteries out there in geology. Which brings me to marine facies. That's kind of a word that people go, I don't understand that. You can also hear the word facies, which is another correct pronunciation. Basically, what marine facies represents are sea level changes from geologic time. So I have to be very straightforward and tell you that climate have shifted from cold, like global coolings, ice ages, to global warmings multiple times and back to coolings and warmings. So without getting into a climate discussion today, we'll do that later in this semester, there are natural things that cause this to happen. Little different in today's world where we have anthropogenic sources of change, which are human added elements for climate change. But there are some natural things that cause that, and we'll get to them in a minute. This is the North American craton or continent. That's what we refer to a, the interiors of a continent as a craton during the Cretaceous period. This big waterway that exists right in here is called the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. You can see that this section of North America was exposed, this one was, and this one was. I'll take a moment to say that's important for not just because we'll have marine rocks where the ocean is, but look at the places where the beach lines would be. We use beach lines to help track the movements of sea levels over time, but I also might add there'd be some probably some really cool fossils in these areas indeed, and that is the case, like dinosaur fossils. I can't imagine dinosaurs are much different than humans and the fact that they would have looked for a really great habitat that existed along coastal areas. <laughs> and so we happen to find a very large concentration of Cretaceous age dinosaur fossils on the areas that were dry terrestrial during this time period. Anywhere that's covered with water, you're going to find marine fossils, which is certainly the case for the Cretaceous Interior Seaway, including Waco, Texas, where that marine rock was that I showed you for Lover's Leap. Sometimes seeing a visual of what a marine facies looks like would help. 
So this is a shot I took from a helicopter on the Great Barrier Reef, and that's the the boat we came in on, and I'm actually up in the sky in the helicopter taking a shot just as we're taking off. And you have to travel hours by boat away from the Australian coast to get to the Great Barrier Reef from where we took off. And so it was not an, a fast thing to get there. But I wanted to show this to you because this is a great look at probably what existed right here in Waco, Texas, where I showed you Lover's Leap back in the Cretaceous period. Shallow is a perspective that is different to a person before they've been exposed to geology when you're talking about oceans. So I think of the deep end of the pool as deep until I started diving. And then as I learned how to scuba dive and got certified, my perception on depth changed. And I would tell you that as you go down even just 100 or 200 feet, the amount of sunlight that gets down there changes. So consequently, so does the pressure of the water. This changes what can live there, which is why most coral reefs exist in about 100 to 150 feet of water, the ones that have the real pretty branches and stuff. And when you start getting deeper, it's just too much pressure. It can break some of those corals. That's why you'll find more platy corals the deeper you go. And honestly, you can get deposition of what I'm pointing to here, which is carbonate material in water that's super shallow, just a 10 foot area could generate that. So oftentimes I hear people talk about limestone and marine facies and transgressions and they say, well, it's deeper water. I think what they really should be saying is that it's farther away from terrigenous sediment. What do I mean by terrigenous? That goes back to terrestrial. <laughs> Land sediments that are weathered and eroded get deposited into rivers, lakes, streams, estuaries, deltas, and beaches, right? So the further away you get from a continent, the less terrigenous or land-bearing sediment you will have. So out in the open ocean like this, you're not getting terrigenous sediment, very minimal, if any. So what's causing the sediments is a biochemical process where either dead animals sink to the bottom of the ocean and make the sediments, or you get a precipitate that forms causing the sediments, meaning the carbonate mud in the case of limestone. So epiric seas is simply a term that represents what you see here, shallow seas. So I want you to imagine what that would look like where you live if you were on a continent and this existed. So that frame of going back to North America, if you can imagine that almost the entire North America has been covered multiple times in geologic past with an epiric sea, then you start to realize why we can find marine rock all over continents. It doesn't belong there. It shouldn't be there unless the conditions, the depositional environment, that is, is conducive to forming rocks like limestone. There's ample proof and evidence that sea level has changed in ancient geologic time. I would say multiple events. And we know that because we can track the rock layers that are made during a transgression and regression. But let me start with providing you a little proof and evidence that this happens. So let's start with something that's going on today and show you what that looks like in a different place. So on the left, you see the most famous stromatolites in the world in Shark Bay, Australia. When I went to Australia, it was on my bucket list to go here. I mean, and as a geologist, this is like one of the flagship items to see. And it was a long way from where I was when I showed you the Great Barrier Reef, which is kind of on the northern coast. This is all the way on the west coast, hundreds of kilometers away from Perth, Australia. And I had to fly there and then drive. So I got there, and this is really a tidal flat area. So while we might expect to see stromatolites along a coast today, let's apply that to what you see on the right picture. This is... Glacier National Park in Montana. So that's northern, right next to Canada, northern Midwest area. 
and you look at this and that is a fossil and a whole outcrop of stromatolites. What that tells me is that at one point, this area used to be covered with a shallow epiric sea conducive enough to forming stromatolites. So you got to look at the clues and understand why would I have limestone all the way in Montana? That means sea level must have been much higher at some point when these stromatolites existed. All right, here's another example of sea level changes. This is a, an angular unconformity, and this is actually in Arizona. And what I'm seeing in the bottom are cross-bedded items from the Coconino sandstone, and then abruptly something changes on the rock layer above it. This is important because it tells us that potentially there could be a shoreline there. While the Coconino sandstone is definitively high angle cross beds, which indicates deserts, you have to look at the rocks around you. So let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that these were beach sands. That would be an indicator that you would have the beach line that existed in this area at some point in geologic past. Going back to Lover's Leap, this is such a great place to see transgressions and regressions. However, this area of Waco during the Cretaceous was nowhere near a shoreline to form things like the shoreline sands or the near shore siltstones. Instead, this was either lagoonal, where coral reefs would have existed when the sea level was a tad bit lower, and then when it got a little higher in a transgression, sea level was able to create the limestone, which is the open ocean rock. This particular place is indicative of being covered by an ocean for the duration of most of the Cretaceous period. When we get a little closer to Lover's Leap, the individual layers you can see very well here. This is a close-up shot on the trail. The big blocky layers represent the transgressions and they're made out of limestone. And in between them are shale layers that are real thin paper laminate layers. So you draw that with all dashes, you draw the limestone with blocks. And you can kind of see that, right? You can see how that looks. The reason the limestone makes little cliffs is really about differential weathering. They're just tougher than the shale so they don't weather as fast. So remember that I was talking about depth a minute ago for importance of understanding where these rocks were deposited. There comes a point in depth that you just don't really form the rocks that make what we would see in transgressions. So we refer to deep as about 800 feet and less. I know that seems very big spectrum <laughs> of range and you can give or take a little bit but the reason that's important is that's pretty much where sunlight doesn't penetrate very well anymore and quite frankly most of the depth of oceans are just several hundred feet when we're talking about an empiric sea that would have laid down what you're seeing right here. So it's important as we move forward for you to understand reasons why sea level could come onto the continent and subsequently why does it come off. So when sea level rises and comes onto a continent as an empiric sea, we call that a transgression. Trans means to advance. So what we have are three fundamental causes of this issue. Number one is any kind of glacial ice, polar cap, or sea ice melts, which causes sea level to rise. This is already happening today in the here and the now in many coastal areas of the world that are at sea level, combating rising tides and rising seas because we're adding more water to the ocean as our ice caps melt. Reason number two that you'd have a transgression, you get land subsidence. Let me give you an example. There are places in New Orleans where the land is sinking because they're literally people are pumping out too much groundwater. So the land is subsiding. And this can naturally happen for geologic reasons as well. So you can imagine if you got subsidence, and land is dropping, that that area would flood out. The third reason would be the growth of mid-oceanic ridges at the bottom of the ocean. 
So you have to imagine those are mountains that happen as the seafloor spreads. And when you get real active, fast uh, seafloor spreading, this causes a higher ridge. And that higher ridge pushes the water up and onto the continents. That is a very common reason why we have transgressions. But the probably number one reason is the melting of ice caps. So what can cause sea level to come off the continent or to lower? And that's called a regression. Re means to retreat. So there's three reasons this can happen. Number one, the glacial ice starts to form, whether it's your just regular glaciers, polar caps, and certainly sea ice. Uh, that sea ice is fundamental to understanding transgressions and regressions. So that's gonna take water from the ocean, especially if it's sea ice. Number two reasons mountains get uplifted in an area. So as they uplift, it takes more water to flood out that area. And mountains can also act as a barrier, right, to advancing seas where it has to travel around that topographic barrier. A very common reason for a regression is we get a slowing down of mid-oceanic ridge formation. And this is a great example of that. If you come over here, the fast spreading would create a transgression. The slow spreading, can you see how the elevation dropped? That would be indicative of a regression. So these are the reasons that transgressions and regressions occur worldwide. When we see sea level changes during periods of high level, especially transgressions, this is when the deposition of sediment starts to happen on continents and in the ocean. That's one reason we have a lot more fossils of ocean-bearing critters than we do land-bearing critters that get a better chance of being fossilized. You learned that in the last section that we covered. So the continental shelf is an extension of the continents that's typically covered by seawater. That seawater and ocean will move onto the continent as an empiric sea during a transgression. We have a lot more potential for sediments to get deposited during a transgression than we do a regression because during a regression elements of weathering and erosion are present that can literally take away the evidence that the rock layers were ever deposited. So if you get let's say five rock layers where you live during a transgression as soon as the water gets off elements of wind rivers glaciers other natural weathering and erosion forces can take those rock layers away. So sometimes we lose rock layers in the rock record. We'll get to that shortly. All right, so we can track the rise and fall of sea level by looking at rocks that form at the same time in different depositional environments. So we follow that and as rocks are deposited in the same area, <laughs> meaning depositional area at the same time, we get a series of rock layers that can help us decipher where the ancient sea used to be. The key is understanding that rock layers are deposited at simultaneously in an ocean environment. So you get the shoreline rocks, which would be something like the sandstones, the near shore, which is the siltstones, the lagoonal rocks, which are the shales or mudstones, and then the open ocean, which can be the carbonate muds, aka limestone. All of these rocks are forming at the same time in a geologic period. So let's take the Cretaceous period, for example, since we were looking at Lover's Leap. Some somewhere there was a shoreline for that transgression. It just wasn't where you saw Lover's Leap. It's somewhere more interior in the continent. Somewhere there's a near shore environment set of rocks. It's just where we find Lover's Leap, we find lagoons and open ocean rocks. So somewhere else you're gonna see the beach line, the sandstones and the silt stones representing the near shore. So in this picture right here off of South Point, Hawaii, I took this shot because you can clearly see that's where we would form beach line sediments. And I was actually hiking on a beach when I took this. So I would expect to find, if we were having a marine transgression, I would find the sandstone there. Even a regression, if this was the shoreline, that's where you're going to find the beach line sediments being made. So let's get to the four primary depositional environments that make up marine facies. 
the shoreline is where you're going to find sandstone. So the shoreline depositional environment is your beach, and the beach are typically made of sands. The material of sands, meaning how big the grain or the actual content, whether it's quartz base or some other type material, it is typically a high energy condition, meaning those waves are constantly moving and just smashing rocks up to make them sand grain size. And that's why we get sand beaches. In this case, this is the grain sand beach at South Point, Hawaii, made out of uh, olivine or peridot. <laughs> and so when the sand is finally lithified, when this stuff does, we'll have green sandstone. This is an example of a beach line and you can see the high energy surf. This is what creates the sands that makes beaches. This happens to be green sand beach in Hawaii South Point. But sandstone represents a high energy depositional environment. At the same time the shoreline or the beach is forming, we have a near shore environment. So what's the deal with the near shore environment? This is where we form our siltstones. And let me be clear, I don't go from sand and automatically shift into siltstone. It takes a grade of time. So as you're looking at rock layers, you'll distinctively see your sandstone and then it starts to get smaller grains and then smaller until you get into siltstone. So it grades over a period of distance until you get full siltstone. So this is a moderate energy environment because we still have enough energy to keep suspension of some sands, but it's low enough energy that you can form also mudstone and shales. So the mixture of sand and mud creates us the siltstone. So this would be the near shore environment. It's a, still a little bit of sand, but also evidence that you're getting a calmer, not as vigorous an energy environment as you would with the beach. This brings me to the lagoons and the shale. The lagoonal environments are where we find things like coral reefs, and we find a predominant amount of shale in these areas. You can also find carbonate muds too. And when this occurs, these are low energy environments. Typically in these rocks, we find lots of coral reef fossils, and that's important. So this is the Great Barrier Reef. I took this shot to show you that we would have had shale forming in these lagoons. Lagoons are a much lower energy environment and conditions that are favorable for things like coral reefs to grow as compared to silt or near shore and certainly beach lines. That's why you don't see corals forming in those areas. You have to have the right energy conditions to form it. So when the shale or mud gets lithified and hardened, it turns into shale. So we draw shale with all dashes and here's an example of what you might find in the bottom of that area is that rock right there. This is a lagoonal environment and this is the type of environment you would expect to see if you were going to be looking at a marine environment indicative of lagoons. Notice there's lower energy and that is why you form these rocks there. Which moves us to the open ocean. So this is another shot of the Great Barrier Reef. You're like, well, you just show me that for shale. Yes, but I want to give you some evidence of what carbonate looks like, <laughs> carbonate mud. This is open ocean. We are literally, we were about 20 kilometers or, or so away from the coastline when we took this tour. It might not have been quite that far, but it sure seemed like it. It was a long boat ride. <laughs> and we get out there and there's carbonate mud everywhere. And carbonate mud is limestone. The point that I'm showing you this is the depth does not have to be hundreds and hundreds of feet deep. It's deeper than it looks here. So if I had to guess, because we were flying over it, and then I actually took a dive and snorkeled out there, the depth was probably 60 to 70 feet in this area, but we could form it in as shallow as 5 or 10 feet of water. The point is we're far away from a terrigenous. Here's that word, terrigenous. Far away from a terrigenous input of sediment, meaning we're not near land. So if you're near an island, you could start forming limestone very quickly because there's just not enough terrigenous sediment. But when you're along a major coastline, 
There's lots of sediments being brought into the ocean by rivers and natural weathering processes and erosion processes. But in the open ocean, we don't form a majority of the sediments out there through detrital or terrigenous materials. Instead, we're forming it from biochemical processes. Either one, we're making the sediments by dead fossil animals going to the bottom, typically microscopic ones, and or we have precipitates that form from a chemical process for sedimentary rock formation. Nevertheless, this forms carbonate mud, which is limestone, and it, it forms in a very low energy environment, far away from any terrigenous input of sediment. So the farther away you get from the coastline, the finer the grain the sediment is going to be because you have less material coming from continents that makes that up. The closer to the shoreline you are, the coarser the material is because you're getting direct deposition of weathered sediments in that area from the continent. So let's talk about transgressions and how we interpret them over multiple sea levels. So looking at something like this, this would be like Lover's Leap, and I am circled the area in which we have at Lover's Leap, which would be the limestone and the shale. And I might point out that you have, see these little jags right here? Some are much bigger than others. This would be like a small transgression, a small regression, a small transgression, a, a pretty moderate regression all the way down to here. So we get a small transgression, moderate regression, small transgression. And one way I can tell that is, you see, this is sea level one, two, and three. And each time I go up, one is the oldest from the law of superposition. The second groups of layers right here would be the middle or middle aged ones. And three is the youngest of the, the group. But limestone couldn't form except to right here during the first sea level. When I rise sea level, it can form in a new place here. I rise it again and it can form way up here where it didn't used to. Subsequently, you can follow the beach line. The first beach line was here, the second one's here, the third one's here. So we can follow the sandstone as it's being deposited and look at where it's traveled. Just notice that in a transgression, one way you can tell on these diagrams that you've got one is that there's a plentiful amount of limestone that's growing each sea level rise. The opposite of a transgression is a regression where the apparent sea, anyway, is starting to fall off the continent. And what will happen is the shoreline moves more back to the ocean. So this is your oldest beach line, your second beach line, and your youngest beach line. Notice that the beach line is moving back out towards the ocean. So this is your sea for continent. This is going to be the wide open ocean. And each time I lower it, my beach line is moving to a new location. You can see that the amount of limestone changes. And by the third sea level, where X marks the spot for, let's say this is just theoretically speaking, let's just say this is the Grand Canyon, I can no longer form limestone in that same area because it's not the right depositional environment. So when you see these block diagrams like this, these lateral block diagrams, be looking for the direction of movement of the beach up or down and then look at the volume of limestone. For a regression, the limestone volume should decrease with each sea level that you have. For a transgression, the volume of limestone should increase with each sea level that you have. So let's look at another way to determine marine facies. So putting those lateral diagrams there, we also have these block diagrams. The colors are irrelative. They're just there to make it easy for you to see. But notice on the transgression, what's on top? We have limestone. Beneath that, we had shale. Beneath that, we had siltstone. And at the bottom, I have sandstone. So what's happened is that's a perfect transgression. The sands existed first, then sea level rose a bit, created an X marks exactly the same spot, GPS location. We could make siltstone. Then we rise sea level a little bit more, and an X marks the spot, the same GPS location, I can start making lagoon environments. I rise the sea level again, and no longer can I make a lagoon. I'm making wide open ocean, which is limestone. So that represents a perfect transgression uh, sequence. And you can see the lateral diagram at the top matches that. 
When we get a regression, the opposite happens. The bottom one represents the oldest rock layer, which is a limestone. A sea level drops, that same X marks the spot GPS location now is favorable to making lagoons. Then we get the next layer above that, which becomes siltstone, which is the nearshore environment as sea level lowers to be favorable to make that kind of condition. Then I get sandstone at the top, which represents the beach line. The point being is that over time, these sequences of rocks represent a sliver of this, right? And specifically this right here. So you can just take a lateral look at or these lateral layers, and then we can take a sequence vertically of them and start to interpret what happened with sea level over time. So which one is the transgression? Is it the top or the bottom? Remember, you're looking for the direction of the movement of sand, the beach. And then secondly, what's happening with the volume of limestone? If the volume of limestone is increasing and the beach line's moving towards the continent, then you have a transgression. In this particular case, you guessed it, it is the lower diagram that makes the transgression. Which is the transgression here? Is it the left diagram or the right diagram? If it's the transgression, you're going to need to be looking for limestone being the most recently deposited on these vertical diagrams of marine facies. So is that the left or the right? If you guessed left, you were correct because limestone's at the top. The regression's the one with sandstone on the top, which is on the right diagram. Which is the regression here? Is it the top or the bottom? Remember, you're looking for the direction of sand and a regression. That means the beach line is going to be going back out laterally towards the ocean, and you should see a lower volume of limestone. So if you guess the bottom diagram, you are correct. That is the regression. Which is the regression here? Is, you got to have sandstone on top because that would represent the, the most modern of the rock layers being the beach line. So that would be the left diagram. All right, that moves us into unconformities. I want you to look at this. I showed this to you earlier. This is an angular unconformity of the Coconino sandstone right near Sedona, Arizona. And what you can notice is that these rock layers here, these cross beds are abruptly cut off and then new ones put on top, new material. That is a good evidence that something happened and we potentially could be missing some geologic time. To start this conversation, we have to talk about what's a conformable versus an unconformable rock strata or rock layer. When you have a conformable rock strata, which is a rock layer, that means that layer was laid down in a sequence that's in, uninterrupted. In other words, it's continuous. There's not gaps in time. It's just being deposited in sequence throughout the same geologic period or stretch of time. In other words, it hasn't been weathered or eroded away. So what's an unconformable rock strata? This is when you have a punctuated section of it missing, meaning there's a chunk of time missing. For example, I showed you in this picture the Great Unconformity, and beneath it you see what's Proterozoic or Precambrian in age, very, very old, billion plus years old. Then you see what's called the Great Unconformity, and the rocks directly above that represent rocks that are around 542-ish million years old as opposed to over a billion years old beneath it. So where is everything in between? Were rocks ever made there? That's a great question. So if you've been wondering, hmm, I wonder if this is a bunch of poppycock. <laughs> like, is it really happening? Do these rock layers really get made and then eroded away? Maybe. Some cases that may not happen where we have a period of stretch of time where there's really not much deposition. And if there is, it's weathered and eroded away. Most unconformities are typically made from periods of erosion. But what I want to point out is that geologists can determine that an unconformity exists because they may find a rock layer in one area that's nearby it, but missing in another area. For example, on the left, <laughs> this is Sedona. 
And there's two rock layers here that I want to point out. This is the Bell Rock and then the big blocky layers, the Fort Apache limestone, all part of the Sedona area, which is, I might add, not very far from the Grand Canyon. And above these rock layers up here is a rock layer that we do find in the Grand Canyon, but we don't find this rock in this rock layer in the Grand Canyon. We do find the one way down here called the Hermit Shale. So we're missing this sequence of rocks in the Grand Canyon. So why didn't it form there? That's a good question. Likely it did and it got eroded away. So that would be an example of an unconformity. So we find rock layers in Sedona that's not in Grand Canyon nearby. That's a good indicator that we had some process of erosion. This is Sedona, Arizona, and you're looking at a cross-bedded formation called the Coconino Sandstone. This is found in the Grand Canyon, this layer, and also in Sedona. But the one that's going to be zoomed in on the right, that's a very red color, that is the Bell Rock member which is not found in the Grand Canyon. The likely cause for that is erosion because these two places are very close in proximity. So if we have it in Sedona, why don't we have it just about an hour and a half drive in the Grand Canyon? Down at the bottom where you see the red layer where the trees are, that's the Hermit Shale. We do find that in the Grand Canyon and in Sedona. Again, these are indicative of erosion causing unconformities. So geologists use block diagrams and use those rock symbols you learned about in marine facies to depict what kind of rocks are found in these various unconformities. Another thing you need to know is most unconformities on a block diagram are done using a wavy surface which represents an irregular erosional surface. Sometimes it's done with a red line but most of the time it represents this kind of depiction right here would indicate that you have an erosional surface. In other words, these tilted or angled beds got worn off before new flat ones got put on top. That brings me to the easiest type of unconformity to recognize, and that's an angular unconformity. So a little bit of help from the get-go of unconformities. Two of the unconformities involved only sedimentary rock on the bottom, meaning the older rock, and on the top, and in between there's an unconformable contact. There's only one type that has non-sedimentary rocks involved at the bottom, and we'll get to that one, but it has sedimentary on the top. So the first two we'll learn about involve sedimentary on both places, above and below the unconformable contact. And just to refresh, an unconformable contact means that, or rock layer, means that we're missing some geologic time there. So in this case, do you see the tilted rock layers right here overlain by flat sedimentary rocks? Well, these are older rocks overlain by younger flat sedimentary rocks with some geologic time missing in between them. So any kind of angular or tilted layers at the bottom qualifies with it has new sedimentary rocks on top as an angular unconformity. The disconformities, in my opinion, are the hardest to recognize. Sometimes you need fossil evidence to help you with this, or at least a geology map where geologists have dated the rock layers. But this is an example in the Grand Canyon where you have that hermit shale I was talking about in Sedona overlain by the Coconino sandstone, which is cross-bedded. I also showed you that in Sedona. What's missing between the two are the same rocks that we have in Sedona that I showed you, like the Bell Rock uh, member and the Fort Apache limestone. We don't have those here, so there's a gap of missing time. I like to think of that as a disappearing act, where something was eroded away or not deposited in this area, and flat sedimentary rocks or horizontal rocks were laid down. We take off or not, deposit for a while, and then new sedimentary rocks that are flat get put on top. Disconformity simply represents two parallel rock layers with a sandwich missing in between. So essentially it'd be like you made a sandwich and the stuff in the middle is gone. The nonconformity is the one that involves an igneous or metamorphic rock at the bottom 
overlain by younger sedimentary rocks. In most cases, not all, but in many cases where nonconformities exist, like this one, which is the great unconformity, they represent a huge stretch of geologic time that's missing. That's not the case for every single one. But the reason I say that is because down here, like at the Great Unconformity and the Gorge of the Grand Canyon, this was the root of a mountain range. And you'll learn about that in a couple of chapters or sections down the line. And the roots are the insides of a, a mountain. So they took a long time to weather any road down. So once that happens, you get a, likely a transgression, certainly the case in the Grand Canyon that came in and started depositing a beach line, then it was a lagoon, and then we had the open ocean, which is limestone. So there's a sequence of Cambrian aged rocks sitting right on top of the pre Cambrian rocks, but it's a huge stretch of geologic time that's missing. So the big difference for non conformity, I like to say it doesn't conform, it's a non conforming thing. You've got metamorphic or igneous rock at the bottom, overlain by much younger sedimentary rocks above the unconformable contact. This brings me to the most famous of all unconformities in the world called the Great Unconformity. Sometimes people that know about this, they're like, oh, it's only in the Grand Canyon. Well, that's not true, it's worldwide. The difference is, how much missing time exists. And the great unconformity, the smallest amount of time is 100 or so million years. But in the Grand Canyon, and like if you took a hike from the north to the south rim, you would actually be crossing over missing 1.2 billion, B as in Bravo, years of missing time. So depending on the location where you are, the Great Unconformity can have a variance in age, but in the Grand Canyon, it's over a billion years. So it could be caused by either massive erosion and or a deposition that didn't happen over a long stretch of time. So the lines show you the barriers of the, the different rock layers, and this is your old Precambrian Protozoic rock, the big gap in time here. So this is literally about a 1.2 billion year marker from how old this is to the Depeats sandstone. Then above that you get the Bright Angel Shale, the Mauve uh, Limestone. I might add there's another unconformity between the Mauve Limestone and the Red Wall Limestone because Depeats, Bright Angel, and Mauve are all Cambrian in age and the Red Wall is Mississippian in age. So there's lots of geologic time missing there. But the Great Unconformity represents this boundary marker down here between the gorge of the Grand Canyon, which is the, the metamorphic and igneous rocks down here, overlain by much younger sedimentary rocks. And it represented the first major sea level rise that occurred in the North American Craton. So the Great Unconformity in the Grand Canyon is probably the best place in the world to see it because that Protozoic Aged, which is Precambrian, that's that that's the tail end of the Precambrian. It's about a 1.7 billion year old basement rocks, and what I mean by basement, they're the bottom, they're the actual bedrock, and likely they extend for kilometers beneath the surface. Then they're overlain by sedimentary rocks that are 542 million years old or around that time. So there's a huge chunk of time missing, about 1.2 billion years to be exact. So the basement rocks are kind of cool in the Grand Canyon because they're made out of something called the Granite Gorge. And I want to take a minute to say, before you jump to conclusions, that that's all that's down there. The granite's younger than the schist, so the schist existed first and likely metamorphosed all kinds of sedimentary and igneous rocks. And the black seams you see here, these are the schist, and you can see the pinky stuff is where the Zoroaster granite invaded that area back in the Precambrian. So you, there's a lot of history here that you have to kind of unpack and look at. So the Vishnu schist, if you can say that, Vishnu, say that, Vishnu schist, that's the oldest stuff that's down there in the basement rocks of the granite gorge of the Grand Canyon. And that's the Colorado River you see right there. But the Zoroaster granite is invading. It's a little younger. It was a magma intrusion, the law of cross-cutting relationships that occurred down there in the basement rocks. 
The rocks above the grade unconformity represent a classic transgressive sequence where sea level started to invade and cause an empiric sea into Arizona and the North American craton back at the beginning of the Cambrian period. So right above the granite gorge where you have that Zoroaster granite and the Vishnu schist, we're missing a big chunk of time, that 1.2-ish billion years of time. Because right above that sits 542 million year old approximately aged rocks that are shoreline rocks called the Tapete Sandstone. Right above the Tapete Sandstone and X marks the same GPS location, sea level rose a bit and could form the Bright Angel Shale, which would have been a lagoon. And then it rises again and X marks the same GPS location and it's far enough away from terrigenous input that it can create the mob limestone in exactly the same spot. So what it tells us is a story that the Grand Canyon has had a series of lots of things, mountain building events at the bottom that got worn down and eroded. Then we had a transgression. Then we've had various different periods of time because the mob limestone, a big gap exists between the mob limestone and the red wall limestone. So we've had different depositional environments, weathering and erosion. So each story or each layer tells us the stories of the Grand Canyon and the Great Unconformity is one of the big stories of the Grand Canyon. So let's see if you can figure out what type of unconformity this is. I labeled the rocks. You can see the bottom is a granite and the top is a flat sedimentary rock on top. So you've got igneous or metamorphic at the bottom overlain by flat sedimentary rocks. If you guess that that is a nonconformity, you are correct. In this case, we've got a shale layer overlain by something like a sandstone layer, and that is missing some time right where you see the rock hammer right in here. You can see the rock layer abruptly stops. There is some missing time there with flat parallel sedimentary rocks at the bottom with younger flat parallel rocks at the top. So would that be an angular unconformity, a disconformity, or a nonconformity? So it's had a disappearing act right here that would represent a disconformity. You should be able to tell right away by the tilted beds at the bottom what type of unconformity this is. And if you guessed angular unconformity, you are correct. What type of unconformity is this? She's like, I wish she would ask me the same thing twice. Yeah, I would. <laughs> this is an angular unconformity, so definitely important to be able to recognize these in the field. All right, let's apply what you know. Sea level changes have been happening throughout geologic past for billions of years. <laughs> but right now, our sea level problems are a mess for humans because so many humans live along coastlines. About a fourth or more of the world's population lives right along coastal areas that are at sea level or below, I might add. <laughs> like New Orleans. <laughs> and as sea level rises, because climate change is starting to affect and melt our ice packs at both poles, our sea ice, sea level is rising. And as that occurs, what will that do to humans? This is a map of just the U.S. showing areas in blue that could be affected by sea level rise by a certain amount in the future. We're talking like tens of meters of higher. So there's three foot in a meter. So let's just say we have a six meter rise, an 18 foot rise or a 50 foot rise. These areas would be in jeopardy. And that's significant because there's so much population that lives there. Where are they going to move? What's gonna happen? Because this is already a problem in places around the world where people are having to relocate because rising seas are invading their homes, invading their ability to grow crops. One area I'm highly concerned about in North America is this area, which is the Ogallala Aquifer. The Ogallala stretches all the way from the northern panhandle of Texas to the southern part of South Dakota. This is a map showing the water, groundwater that is, aquifer depletion. The redder it is or oranger it is, the less water that exists there. 
So as people in North America, specifically the United States, start to move inland around coastal areas, there'll be a bigger demand on this aquifer system for public drinking water. Right now, it's predominantly used for agriculture. But I point that out because the story about sea level changes, marine phases, is a direct correlation to climate change. And while I don't think that we will probably see this happen maybe in your lifetime, but it could probably in the next hundred or so years or more, we could see this really being problematic for population and United States. So you might have questions or concerns. By the way, what kind of unconformity is this? This is a geology joke for a, a jack-o'-lantern, but you can totally see that there's tilted rocks at the bottom overlain by flat sedimentary rocks on the top. So if you guessed an angular unconformity, you're correct. We're going to take a nature moment now, and once we do, we'll come back and I'll kind of wrap up what are the key things that you need to know before we move into our next section. So welcome back. That was a nice moment, wasn't it, for nature. Let us talk about the next section. You need to read your book. Make sure that you are very familiar with the different parts of rock deformation for folds and the different types of stresses and that cause rock folding and subsequently faults. And we'll be covering all of those things in our next section. Thanks so much for learning about marine facies and unconformities, and I'll see you in the next section. Bye.